Today I'm going to talk about the slide deck on accessibility. Um, this is probably quite an important uh, deck because it's what leads into the big web accessibility guidelines assignment. So what I'm going to do is talk you through kind of the different types of disabilities that are there. I'm going to talk you through some of the reasons why it's important that we address some of the access issues that people have and what they look like today because what they look like today is something very different to what they looked like you know maybe just a few years ago in some cases um, and then what I'm going to do is talk you through the web concertum accessibility guidelines uh, and that will lead on to a separate video which talks about the assessment so accessibility that we talk about traditionally refers to the design of products, devices, services or environments for people with disabilities. Now that environment one is very important because historically when we talk about accessibility we talk about accessible environments. So you see a lot of things to do with people having access to spaces, physical spaces, so it's about having wheelchair access, it's about having rest points and long hospital corridors for example, uh, so it's very much about getting the person to a place. Now, uh, with big government drives, um, talking about getting services available online, uh, more and more medical technology devices being deployed into people's homes. You can have dialysis at home now, you can have um, sleep apnea devices, uh, lots of, kind of even things like uh, blood sugar monitors now have accessibility issues because people have um, coexisting impairments that are hard to design for all in one go. So <clears throat> there is a big market for this. There's a lot of people that need accessibility and generally the kind of accepted theme within the accessibility industry is that if you make things accessible for people you create a best practice and you create an environment in which everyone can access all of these products, devices, services and environments and so on and that they can do so in a way that doesn't cause stress or anxiety or needing to have additional devices if possible. So it relates very closely to uh, this concept of inclusive design. So inclusive design is things that are accessible to as many people as possible without the need for adaptation. So the British Standard Institute um, recognised that this was an important thing. Uh, so the star so the International Standards Organization is a similar idea and it looks at building standards and building things that are the same across all industries or that people within an industry can all comply with. So things like plugs. Electricity has a standard within Britain and everyone who wants to connect to the electricity supply either tapping into or using a device that plugs in has to follow these standards. So that's the same for everyone and that is basically what we're trying to achieve by making sure that the design of everything can accommodate everybody. Of course that's very difficult. Uh, we know that you know everyone is different. We know that everyone's got nuances in terms of what they can and can't do. And so it's about coping with those changes rather than eliminating them altogether. That wrong way. So in terms of disabilities, disabilities as I said previously was considered to be something to do with physical access. The societal model of disability now is that we we accept um, everybody's ability and disability that it's related to the person. So the use of language here is very important. So it's not um, the disabled person, it's the person with a disability. So we lead, we use a person-centric approach and we lead by saying the person with something because at the end of the day what we value most is that they're a person. So actually less than 8% of recorded disabilities are actually to do with a physical impairment such that someone needs to use a wheelchair. It's very strongly linked to age. So if you take uh, young people, teenagers 16 to 19 years old, only 2% of them are recorded as having a disability, but that rises to 78% in people who are 85 and older. And if we take into account that we have an ageing population, that number is big because of that and it's going to get bigger. So in the UK, 
11 million people have got a life-limiting illness, impairment or disability. So a bit of nomenclature. An impairment means um, any loss of function, whereas a disability is that you're unable to perform an activity or uh, do something out with the, the typical range. So note that I use the word typical, I don't use the word normal. Normal is a very medical thing. It's a very kind of binary, you're either normal or you're not. Uh, well, uh, you can be typical or you can be outside of the typical range. It's just the language that we use when you're talking about that. So as an example, someone who has a visual impairment, who perhaps is blind in fact, they are unable to read printed material. So their impairment is that they have a, a visual impairment. The disability is that they're unable to use the same material as someone who has typical vision has. So you might need a braille printed material uh, or a reader to let you access written stuff. So that's our example. John Smith is blind. So that impairment is related to his physiology whereas his disability is functional. So if he's presented, prevented from doing something, so if he's prevented from attending school as a result of that disability, for example, that would be known as a handicap. So a handicap, as, as a descriptor, is used less and less, and now all the literature and the vast majority of um, people who work in the industry and people who certainly um, with public face and organisations is that they would consider someone to have an impairment or a disability. Visual impairments are probably one of the biggest um, types of impairment or categories of impairment that we have. So in the UK alone, almost 2 million people, or 1.86. The most recent figures I have say that they've got some kind of sight loss. So that might be that you have, you're short-sighted or long-sighted, Lots of us wear glasses, so I have an astigmatism, so it means that uh, the kind of vertical part, the vertical frame is squashed slightly when I look at things. I don't notice it unless I'm reading a lot, because the lines tend to get very close together and it's hard for me to see. So I'll wear glasses if I'm working at a computer or something, or I'm reading music, for example. You might have a degenerative condition, so you might have diabetic retinopathy, where your eyesight deteriorates as a result of another condition. Uh, you might have glaucoma. All sorts of things will mean that your eyesight deteriorates as you grow older. And the fact of just growing older, the amount of people who have visual impairments when they're older is much greater than when they're younger, because over time, that system just does deteriorate. A very specific type of visual impairment, though, colour vision deficiency. So colour vision deficiency affects men much more than women. Uh, it's actually related to sight loss when you're older. So lots of people who are older develop some level of colour vision deficiency. Uh, they just assume it's part of being older. Um, but again, that typically affects men more than women. So you get different types. Uh, if you have normal colour vision or typical colour vision, it should be, you can see all the different colours in that spectrum. Uh, depending on the different types of colour vision you have, you might not be able to see different colours. So you might not be able to see red or green or blue. Um, in some cases it's quite hard to tell the difference between yellow and green, red and green, and that sort of thing. A lot of people don't realise they have a visual impairment until they actually have to distinguish between these colours. And that is a good thing for accessibility and then it means accessibility is working because you're up until that point, you've never relied solely on colour. There's always been some other cue, some other clue that would help you figure that out. Uh, so that's the impairment. A hearing impairment. So in the UK, again, typically related to age, people have declining hearing as they're older um, and typically will require to use hearing aids after a certain point. A lot of people still don't use hearing aids, um, because typically older generation, because there's a historical stigma for them in terms of using hearing aids. 
it's also an admission sometimes that I'm getting old and I've got to wear a hearing aid so people can avoid it if they can. Uh, so about one in seven people in the UK are either deaf or hard of hearing. So hard, or he hard of hearing is something where your level of hearing or your hearing impairment causes you difficulties in everyday life that you have to make adjustments for. So that's quite profound um, hearing loss. The other thing that a hearing impairment can cause, which is linked, is that you have difficulties with learning language. Uh, so part of learning language is babbling and making sounds when you're a baby. And if you can't make those sounds, you can't hear those sounds, it's difficult to make them because you don't know what sound you're actually creating. Uh, so you can have that difficulty in terms of understanding the phonetics of language and how it all joins together. Uh, physical impairments. So about 2% of the population use wheelchairs in some form. Uh, sometimes that is to do with a congenital dis uh, disability. So if you're born with cerebral palsy, for example, so one in 400 children are born with cerebral palsy. Not all of those children will go on to use wheelchairs. So that it may be that they just have difficulties with particular types of fine motor control um, or gross motor control. But if you, you can have a varying level of impairment before you require uh, to use a wheelchair. So you can have lots of different reasons for doing it again. Age is a primary, primary reason. That's how all, a lot of those things you can see. Uh, but one of the biggest hidden disabilities is a cognitive impairment. So every week in the UK, about 200 babies are born with some kind of learning disability. For some people that can be uh, a minor thing, for some people that can be a major thing. It includes things like dyslexia, which is a fairly common learning disability. It's uh, to do with issues with language and so on, but it means that someone who has dyslexia is going to have to make some adjustment in how they learn as a result of their disability. That's something that you typically will live with as you're a child. Dementia, however, affects people once they're older. So 5% over the age of 65 and 20% over 80. Dementia is an issue where you lose information in your short term memory. So you forget what you had for lunch um, you can forget who people are, but you remember events from a long, long time ago. Uh, remember events from your childhood when you were a young adult, remember your child being born and so on. So all of these things can make living with dementia and Alzheimer's very difficult. Um, but that again is going to be a much bigger problem as we get older or as the population gets older because we're going to keep um, increasing that age range and the strain on resources is going to increase. Uh, so ageing again, primary cause um, of service strain and so on in the country. Uh, so these are all things that you have all of the time. They might affect you in different contexts more than others, but it's something that is kind of intrinsic to you. Uh, there are some something called a situational impairment, which means that it's affected by where you are. Uh, so for example, I might be uh, watching a movie on my laptop or whatever. Um, I want to switch to move it on my mobile phone, uh, but I've got no headphones, so I can't watch it on the bus. Uh, so being on the bus is my impairment. Um, being on the bus might mean that it's bumpy, so it means you can't send text messages very easily, so that might be might be affecting your fine motor control because you're moving around a lot. Uh, sunlight is the biggest situational impairment that people would report. So if you've ever tried to send a text message outside in the sun, I've lost track of the amount of times that I look out, it's a sunny day and I think I'm going to take my laptop outside and I'm going to work outside and that lasts about five minutes because I can't see a damn thing on the screen and I need to come back in. Uh, it might be very temporary, might just be something that happens for a short time, might be something that happens a little bit longer and that is determined by what that situation is. So if you have an arm, if you have a permanent uh, impairment, that might be that you have the loss of a limb. However, if you have an arm injury, 
that might be a long term thing. But it may be very situational if I'm a new parent and that arm is just busy holding the child. So the duration and the severity of situational impairments will vary greatly. Um, it's not something that has been looked at in any great depth. Uh, lots of people talk about designing for situational impairments, uh, but very few people have actually researched how to avoid them. Because they are so varied, it makes it, <coughs> makes it very difficult. Uh, so the main thing in terms of legislation that has um, kind of arrived in the last little while is the Equality Act. So the Equality Act uh, 2010 is the, singest lar sing it is the single largest piece of anti-discrimination legislation that the UK has known. Uh, so it came around as an amalgamation effort. So it combined the previous uh, Disability Discrimination Act and the previous Sexual Discrimination Act and put them together. So by bringing, and other stuff as well, but that's the main one. So bringing these things together, it means that you can it's easier to legislate because it's all contained under one thing. So what it does is it requires people to have equal treatment and access to employment, public and private services, regardless of the protected characteristics. So those protected characteristics are age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, race, religion, sex and sexual orientation. So it is illegal in the UK under the Equality Act 2010 to discriminate intentionally or unintentionally against people who fit or who identify with those protected characteristics. So where that is a disability, employers and service providers are required to make reasonable adjustments. So what is reasonable will depend greatly on the importance of the service, the necessity of the service. So if it's a government service, for example, it's very important. Um, and the size of business. So if I'm a sole trader, what is reasonable for me may be slightly different than what's reasonable for, I don't know, your Googles of the world, your JP Morgans of the world, IBM, that sort of thing. So it defines disability, that's important. So it's physical or mental impairment which has substantial and long-term adverse effect on your ability to do day-to-day -day activities. So that is not a situational impairment. It's something that happens over a long period of time and has a substantial effect. So if it's something minor, it's unlikely to be dealt with under the Equality Act, uh, simply because if it's minor, um, it's not in the, the legislative interest uh, to pursue. Uh, but if it starts to affect lots of people, then that becomes a substantial issue. So the crucial point here is that it's a physical or a mental impairment. And that mental impairment is something that I, I think is becoming more and more these days. Because as a society, we're becoming much more aware of mental illness and mental difficulties. So more and more people are reporting the effect of that on their life. And as we see more and more of that reporting, we're going to see more and more legislative effort to uh, counteract that, I guess. So, yeah, so it depends on, um, for reasonable adjustments, how practical those are, how big an organisation I am, uh, how much money and resources I have to make those changes, and whether or not I've made an attempt already. So an example might be, um, if I want to change the physical features of a building, so if I want to add a ramp or automatic doors, that might be limited by, if it's a listed building, I might not be able to do that. So what other things can I put in place to solve that? It may be that um, if I was to add a ramp, the ramp would be too steep because of the space I have available in front of the building. So I've got to think of something else. Um, in terms of providing additional aids or services, uh, you'll see a lot, like the induction loop for hearing aids, you'll see that a lot of time. Um, providing sign language interpreters. So if I was, you know, a small corner shop, it probably wouldn't be reasonable for me to provide a sign language interpreter because 
you know, the number of people I have in my shop who require it mean that it's an unnecessary expense for me and it would actually be the detriment to my company. Um, at least that's how the Equality Act would see it. However, if I'm having a exam, you know, I'm having a conference for disability or a conference for accessibility, yes, I'm going to have sign language interpreters. Uh, there was a, something in the news recently about um, a parent who was taking her child to see a One Direction concert and she was suing the concert uh, promotions company because she contacted them beforehand and she said that she was coming to see One Direction and she was taking her daughters and her daughter's friend who were uh, hearing, so they were fine. They didn't have any access issue. But she was taking her along and she wanted to be able to have a similar experience. Could they provide an interpreter? And they ignored her and they ignored her and they ignored her. And then the day before the conference, uh, the uh, concert, they provided an interpreter, but only for the One Direction part. So for the hour or so beforehand, when it was to go at, there was no interpreter. Uh, so currently she's suing the conference organisers because they didn't allow her an equitable So, currently in process, we'll see what ends up coming out of that. So, more sp even more specifically than that, uh, what we're particularly interested in this session is web accessibility. So, there are many ways for us to access the internet, and we use it for lots of things. So, we use it for entertainment, we use it for education, we use it for communication, um, slightly old. Uh, image there of um, Apple, what's now Apple Wallet, I believe, so it's, or the equivalent is Google Pay. Can you use that? You can use your phone as a device to pay, and that of course you use the internet. For people to use online, we need to think about what we're creating and how that will appear to lots of different users. So we access the internet through lots and lots of different devices. So we access it through um, phones, laptops, tablets, watches, uh, things like TV, uh, box devices as well. So some people can access uh, that information via a browser. So if we put it into a browser, some people need to use additional technologies to access that. So that might be uh, people who have visual impairments who might use a screen reader, so that would just read things out. Uh, they might have things like uh, a learning difficulty, something like dyslexia, where they can use different colours. So if you use a specific style sheet, that can help you with dyslexia. Uh, in particular, you want to avoid things that have something that's too high a contrast, uh, something like a slightly pastel coloured theme to yellow coloured um, backgrounds can help improve the contrast. You might have a specific font or fonts that have been designed specifically for uh, people who have dyslexia. So you can access things in lots of different ways. You can add things to it. But get to the information. Crucial thing, it's about getting to the information on the internet. So the assistive technology is all of those devices that people can use. So screen readers, magnifiers, people might use a joystick to help them access the internet if they can't use a mouse. Braille output we've talked about already. So assistive technology we talk about meaning any device or system that lets people do something that they couldn't do without it. The internet, unfortunately, is one of those... Um, one of those systems where people have a lot of access issues and the reason they have a lot of access issues is because so many people create content it's so easy to create content web browsers are very forgiving if you have poor html 
because it's a service provision reason. Like they don't want people to see, no, I can't, I can't render this because of poor HTML. People will stop using the browser. So, the fact that it is everywhere, and that's the power, right? The power of the web, according to Tim Berners Lee, is that everyone can access it. Everyone can do something. But that is unfortunately that everyone having access to it is a benefit and a challenge at the same time. And it's finding a balance between letting people create stuff without the appropriate uh, kind of markup all the time versus letting people uh, see what they can do. Why do we want to make the web accessible? So there's probably four reasons why we want to make it accessible. The first of that is social. So in society we have a digital divide. We have a digital divide between people who can use technology, who can access services, and then people who can't. So typically you might have a digital divide in a rural area, so someone who is in a rural area. those situational impairments when you talk about mobile technology, talk about portability. Access issues because of decline in physical ability. If you have a an accessible website, you're going to if you design for accessibility, you reduce the overall development time because you embed those accessibility things within your design and you don't have to back and add them on afterwards, which is what causes a lot of extra time on projects when you realise that it isn't accessible. Your site structure is set, you don't have to back and change that later, which will then have a knock on effect on a number of other things in your architecture. Financial. It costs a lot to maintain a website that isn't accessible because you're constantly updating things all the time. You can optimise for search engines, so your search engine optimization is typically better if you have an accessible website. Uh, because it means that all if, if you make something accessible, it means that people can read that material. And if people can read that material, it means the search engine can work at it as well. Um, and then there's the legal issue, which is, of course, your accessibility uh, issues within the Equality Act. But you might have a policy within the company, you might have some design guidelines. Section 508 is the American equivalent of the Equality Act. So it's slightly more um, specific in some ways, uh, but if you work with an American company, they talk about Section 508. It has the same legal ramifications as the Equality Act has in this country. So WebAIM, uh, you can go online and have a look at WebAIM, but they have this hierarchy for motivating for accessibility change. And this is something I see a lot, um, particularly when I, um, I teach students and I experience the value of this themselves. Because a lot of the time you're designing for yourself, so you know what you can access, so you design it that way. If you're trying to, oh jeez, if you're trying to create uh, a driver for change, often we get very stuck at this punish and require stage. So the first stage is guilt, so people feel some kind of personal guilt that actually they didn't do this and they should. Then you have punishment if you don't, that's your Equality Act, Section 508. Then you require people to do it through legal means and so on. But I mean, you, you people know they have to do it. But until you actually reward people for doing it, once you reward people for doing it and they see the benefits of it, so that may be a physical um, external motivator. It might be, well, if people with accessibilities use our site, such and such a thing will happen. 
will give you vouchers if you design an accessible website you'll get a bonus based on that it may also be an intrinsic motivation that actually you want to help people and you want to benefit society and once that happens it allows you to share that you're motivated then to share that information with others you become an enlightened person in terms of accessibility and you want to inspire other people so someone who's at the stage where they want to inspire other people to be accessible are much more effective than people who are at the bottom guilt stage who do it for a, a reason it's usually a reason attached to yourself so i feel bad so i will do it because i feel bad rather than the benefit outweighing um, any possible uh, negatives or ramifications of it um, of course there's challenges but that's with it so if you want to uh, write these things into a program you want to write them into a design it probably starts at the user stories phase so rather than saying as a user can you include accessibility related stories that highlight a particular type of user so for example as a keyboard only user I want to be able to use the entire application so that means that everything I do I've got to be able to do with a keyboard only so that means that I don't have like a little flash box and a little JavaScript box that steals my keyboard focus and doesn't ever give it back I can tab through the entire site um, and I don't need a mouse to click on anything it might be that I have limited mobility so I want click areas to be large enough and adequately spaced I could be a colorblind user I could be a user with low vision I could be a user with no vision I could be blind and so I can start to introduce things like I, as a as a blind user I want to use a screen reader to navigate so I'm starting to introduce within my very initial design phase that I need a screen reader so the use of accessible um, additional accessibility technologies and assistive technologies is crucial in that point then I can have different types of um, cognitive disabilities so parallax scrolling is when you scroll parts of the screen and the other parts stay the same and so on uh, so that might be an issue for some people I might have dyscalculia which is similar to dyslexia but with numbers so I find it difficult to distinguish between numbers and I get them often people get them muddled up or they see one number as being something else or they interpret one number rather as being something else and get them muddled up so you can start to introduce all sorts of different types of user stories and what you might find I've got another one what you might find is that um, those types of users and new user stories are driven by uh, users and personas they're driven by background knowledge about who's going to use your system and um, but they're an important thing to have in there one of the ways that we can deal with um, situational user stories is you'll often refer to them as selfish user stories so if you see it's kind of a new um, a new area we're trying to look at which is when i'm developing user stories can I develop user stories for contextual awareness? So, for example, uh, the first one there, as a user in bed with a sleeping boyfriend, I want to watch a video in silence so that I can get caught up with Breaking Bad. So in a situation where I have to be absolutely quiet, how am I going to do that? Um, so the obvious answer is subtitles. And so you would then go off and develop subtitles and ensure that they were included. As a user on a crowded train, I want to navigate a website without using my mouse. So that's a similar idea to your keyboard user, but now people in different situations are taking advantage of that same, the same principle of tab only browsing. And within a remote area, bandwidth, so I want to load pages without images. So when all that goes wrong, when people don't do this, this is what causes problems. Uh, so the first of those problems, or the, the first of those problems that were quite publicly available, was the Sydney 2000 Olympics. 
the Sydney 2000 Olympics um, had a medals table on the website and there was a user who had a visual impairment who tried to use that. They were using a refreshable braille system. Uh, so what that means is that it was using braille to output that information to him. Uh, but what the Olympics website was doing was it was automatically updating that table visually. Every time a medal was won, it would auto-update. But that auto-update didn't trigger an update to any assistive technology because of the way it was structured, I guess. So it meant that users didn't, couldn't um, identify results. They couldn't move within it. They couldn't see those results update. There was also no alt text on their images and you were unable to identify different sports on the schedule unless you had vision of the site. So if you're using a screen reader, um, you had no hope of identity. You just knew that something was happening at that time. You didn't know what it was. Uh, so at the time, they were deemed to be in breach of the Disability Discrimination Act in that a non-sighted user was excluded from public information. So they were fined 20,000 Australian dollars, which at the time was about 12,000 pounds. American Express, uh, they changed the format of their bank statements from an HTML format to PDF, and they didn't code their PDF appropriately. So you can uh, put semantic labeling on different parts of a PDF so that a screen reader can read that information out. Um, they weren't necessarily fined as a result, I don't think. They managed to fix it before it got that far, but they got a lot of bad press through the BBC, on the radio and so on. Uh, so the effect then of bad accessibility was that it probably cost them money because they've been vilified within the disability community for a long time about uh, the fact that initially they didn't want to fix it and it, then it took them a long time to actually fix it. Um, so if they had designed for that accessibility in the first place, they wouldn't have been so negatively portrayed by people. So if you have a website, how do you make it accessible? So this is just a picture of a random road crossing. Uh, so what you can see is that it's a fairly rich experience. There's multiple clues. Uh, so for example, there's tactile things. So you have uh, rivets on the floor, so you know when you're at the crossing. In some cases, the button that you press to say, I want to cross the road. Some of the newer ones that have a, a square block, this is clearly not a UK one or a recent UK one, but the square blocks they have a bit that spins underneath. So if you feel underneath the block, when the green man comes on, it will spin. And that's just a non-visual clue to tell you that it's safe to cross the road. In terms of the red man and the green man, there's some additional distinction between the colours. So one is standing stationary and one is in the shape of walking. Um, and in some cases you've got sound, so you've got beep. Or in some cases when there are many traffic lights together, you'll hear an automated message that says the traffic coming from such and such a street has been signalled to stop. Which tells you that it's the one that you're at, it's not the traffic lights behind you, it's not the traffic lights slightly up the road. You know for sure that the traffic lights you're standing at are the one that's causing, uh, causing all the noise and that you can cross. So having multiple clues, multiple cues, making it a multi-sensory experience is important. And the way you achieve that is through either guidelines or standards. So standards are formal things, they're testable, uh, it's the something that you can be uh, very, very sure that you've met because there are testing criteria. And if there are testing criteria, then uh, you know, you test it and you pass or you fail. And what you want to do is pass everything. In some cases, these are mandatory. So you would not be allowed to create something unless it uh, has that standard pass on everything. Guidelines are less formal and they're much more about giving advice on how to apply some design principles. So you've got the design principle that says users should be aware of system status. So a guideline might be that you should have size 14 font or above on top of a web page indicating the status. So they'll often suggest how to do something, not that you should do it that way. So there might be some testable criteria, but generally there isn't. 
So standards, formal and testable. Guidelines, less formal. Suggestions. If you want to go and read some more, uh, you can find the main link to the accessibility community is going to be online. Um, so hashtag A11Y. So that's a numeronym for accessibility. It's basically the A and the Y as the start and end of accessibility, and then there are 11 letters omitted. So it's a common way of shortening uh, longer words on Twitter, where letter counts, character counts are at a premium. Uh, so you can go and have a have a look on Twitter and see what sort of stuff is available for the accessibility community. I am expecting that you'll find a lot of things to do with visual impairments um, and a lot of things uh, related to kind of wayfinding and navigation and physical um, movement and access. Uh, but you'll find some, you'll find a gem in there, I promise. Okay.